These are the final chapters of Orphan Auntie by David Williams. Chapter 40, The End of a Mystery. What do you mean you've done it before? Called down Stella from the chimney. The girl couldn't believe what she was hearing. That was exactly how Soot had told her he had been killed. Well, you might as well know it was me who made my baby brother, your Uncle Herbert, disappear all those years ago said Aunt Alberta from the fireplace of the dining room. Of course, said Stella, almost to herself. What happened to the baby had remained a mystery for over three decades. When he was born, I knew he would inherit Saxby Hall, and not me, explained Aunt Alberta. I hated him for it, much as I hated your father. So in the dead of night, I crept into his nursery and smuggled him out of the house. How could you do such a thing? demanded the girl. Remarkably easily, replied Alberta. I took him down to the river, put him in a wooden box and set him afloat. I thought the river would swallow him up. But ten years later, there he was on the doorstep of Saxby Hall, dressed as a chimney sweep, exclaimed Soot, exclaimed Stella. Soot, she had to mean Soot. That's right. Alberta was completely taken aback that the little girl had said this. How on earth do you know that? Because the ghost of a chimney sweep haunted this house. Ghosts aren't real, you stupid little child. Yes, they are. That's who has been helping me. You are completely delusional. After everything, still the woman refused to believe. Soot had been right. Grown-ups' minds were too closed to believe in anything other than the here and now. As much as Stella wanted to continue her escape, she was intrigued to know the full story. How did you know the chimney sweep was your baby brother? Because he was the image of my other brother Chester, your father. Short and skinnier, all right. The little urchin had grown up in a workhouse living on scraps of food but he was the absolute spit of Chester. And this revolting, stinking little urchin kept on saying he felt like he had been to Saxby Hall before. It was only a matter of time until the rest of the family worked out who he was too. So I waited until he had crawled up the chimney to clean it. And then I lit the fire below. <coughs> You're a monster. The best part of it was I let one of the servants take the blame. Soot is really my uncle, thought the girl. This was explosive news. That boy is the rightful heir to Saxby Hall, she exclaimed. He was a child. He died many years ago now. Just another little chimney sweep that no one mourned. Stella thought for a moment. My mother, my father, my uncle. How many more people are you going to murder? Just one, replied Aunt Alberta. You. Chapter 41, Hide and Seek. The woman set to work in the dining room, striking a match and lighting the fire. Soon plumes of thick black smoke were snaking up the chimney. Desperately, Stella started clambering upwards again. Her eyes were watering buckets. In next to no time, she could hardly breathe. Within moments, the smoke had plunged the shaft into total darkness. Now she couldn't see a thing. Suddenly, Stella lost her grip and was falling down the tunnel straight towards the fire. Her body bounced off the sides of the chimney, sending soot raining down alongside her. So much soot fell that it put out the fire. Darn it! shouted Alberta, as Stella managed to halt her fall just inches above the open fireplace and began to clamber her way back up. Soon she had reached the very top of the house and squeezed herself out of the chimney pot and onto the roof. Stella lay there for a moment on the snow, gasping to fill her lungs with air. But just as the girl opened her eyes, she saw the top of a ladder appear at the edge of the roof. There was no stopping this evil woman. Soon a shock of soot-encrusted red hair appeared, then two sharp black eyes, then a wicked grin. Our little game of hide-and-seek is over. 
Auntie's found you. The woman hoisted herself up onto the roof and stood for a moment, wobbling slightly. Now it's your choice, child. Would you prefer to jump, or should I give you a nice little gushy wishy? By this time it was night, and Alberta's silhouette was framed by a full moon hanging low in the winter sky. You'll never get away with this, shouted the girl, clinging in terror to the chimney pot. Oh yes, I will. I have got away with everything so far. If you are very lucky, I may even sing at your funeral. I'd rather you didn't, replied Stella. When you sing like you, when you sing, you sound like a foghorn. How dare you! Aunt Alberta lurched towards her, but lost her footing in the snow. Bump. She slid down the roof on her bulging belly. Ah! Just as Stella was hoping. The woman might plunge to her death. She managed to grab onto the guttering with her fingers. At first there was silence as Alberta dangled there. Then the girl heard her aunt say, Stella? Um, Stella Weller? Her voice was soft and sweet now, as if she was the nicest auntie in the world. What? demanded the girl. Would you mind awfully giving your dear old auntie a handy wandy? No. Pleasey wheezy. Why on earth should I? demanded the girl. Alberta's weight was too much for her short, stubby fingers. One by one they were beginning to slip off the guttering. The tone of her voice darkened. Child, if you don't help me, you're going to get the blame for everything. Your parents lit an accident, killing your dear old auntie. But I never did, protested Stella. That's not how it's going to look, oh no. Alberta's words were slipping around the girl's mind now like a snake. The whole country will see you as a cold-hearted killer. You'll be locked away for a hundred years. That's if they don't send you straight to the hangman. Stella didn't know what to think anymore. But, 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 but I haven't done anything wrong, she protested. Letting me die like this would be murder. M-U-D-D-E-R. This wasn't the time to correct her aunt's spelling, so the girl kept silent. Your dear mamma and papa brought you up to be a nice young girl, didn't they? Y yes. You don't want them to be ashamed of their only child, do you? No. Then give me your hand, said Alberta. I promise I won't hurt you. Tentatively. Stella slid herself on her bottom, down the sloping roof towards her aunt. There's a good girl, encouraged her aunt. Trust me, child, I promise nothing bad is going to happen. Stella stretched out a hand towards the woman. Alberta grabbed it firmly and yanked her niece off the roof. Ah, screamed the girl as she flew through the air. She just managed to grab, grab onto Alberta's ankle. The woman looked down at the girl, clinging on for dear life. If I can't have sex with her, then no one can. With that, the woman let go of the guttering and the pair plunged down. Chapter 42. Dead Calm. Suddenly there was the sound of two huge wings flapping. An owl shot through the night air. Whoosh. Stella could feel herself being grabbed as Wagner snatched her from her fall. Aunt Alberta hit the snow below with a gigantic thud. Wagner set the girl down gently before hopping over to his mistress. Stella followed close behind. They needed to check if this evil woman was really dead. Alberta's body had fallen onto a large pile of cleared snow. It lay there perfectly still. There wasn't even the sound of a gurgle or the slightest twitch. All was silent, dead calm. Stella breathed a sigh of relief. Then, just as she was about to turn away, she saw the woman's little finger move. Then her hand, then her arm. Dazed and confused, Alberta pushed herself up to her feet. The snow stayed stuck, up, stuck to her. She looked like the abom abominable snowman, which is a great big white furry ape that lives in the Himalayan mountains in Nepal. 
mother had stood there wobbling for a moment. Before she wiped her eyes clear of snow. She hadn't been injured at all. The huge pile of snow had broken her fall. Now, where were we? said Alberta with a smile. Oh yes, I was just about to bump you off. As the girl made a run for it across the lawn, Wagner shot off into the sky. As he circled in the air, he started squawking wildly. Squawk! 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 It was a sound the girl had never heard the owl make before. Not far off in the trees surrounding Saxby Hall, a chorus of hoots could suddenly be heard. The birds were calling back to Wagner. The branches of the trees rustled as hundreds of owls took to the sky. For Stella, there was no time to think about what was happening. She had to run. But where to? The girl stumbled in the snow. Her aunt caught up with her and pulled a flail from her inside pocket and swung it around her head. <laughs> Alberta must have snatched it from the suit of armour in the, in the hall. The flail was a particularly nasty weapon. It had a long wooden handle with a chain at the top and a deadly spiked metal ball at the end. It could kill a man with one strike. This particular flail hadn't been used as a weapon for hundreds of years, until now. Please, Alberta, I'm begging you, pleaded Stella. Still the woman swung the flail faster and faster around her head. I hope your pathetic little life is flashing before your eyes, child. Because this is the E-N-E-D. End. With that, Alberta swung the flail up in the air. No! Queen Stella. But before she could rain it down on Stella, hundreds of owls whooshed down from above. From the tiniest owlet to the largest great grey owl, together they seized the woman in their claws and with one motion carried her off into the sky. She cried as the flail dropped out of her hand and fell onto the snowy lawn, thump. From the roof, Wagner was squawking loudly, no doubt calling out orders to his fellow owls. All Stella could do was watch in amazement. Aunt Alberta kicked and screamed as a squadron of owls carried her off high into the night sky. The snow fell off her as they took her up way above the clouds. Soon the large lady was little more than a tiny dot. Stella didn't dare blink. She needed to know that this really was the end of the story. Squawk! Wagner called out a deafeningly loud command to his feathered friends up in the air. At once, they all let go of the wicked woman with their claws. screamed Alberta as she tumbled down, down, down through the sky. From far off in a distant field, there was a deafening thud as her body hit the ground. Stella wobbled as the earth shook a little. At last, her awful auntie was no more. The little girl sighed with relief before calling the brave owl over. Wagner! The bird hopped back to where the owl was standing. Thank you, she said and wrapped her arms around him. Slowly but surely, he lengthened his wings and wrapped them around her too. You saved my life, whispered the girl. The great bird twit-wooed softly in reply. Stella didn't know what the owl meant exactly, but somehow she understood. Stella said, Wagner, I still need your help. The bird tilted his head to one side. He was listening. The girl used gestures to help explain herself better. I need you to fly me over to the lake, Stella pointed to it. We need to find Soot, I mean my uncle. The girl climbed onto the bird's back and held tight to the feather tufts on top of his head. With the added weight, Wagner needed a run-up so he could take off, but take off he did. To Stella, this was thrilling. It felt like she was piloting an aeroplane. It was the most splendid sensation flying, the stars above her, the wind in her air. As the owl glided high over the lake, she looked down to see if there was any sign of the ghost. The floating shards of ice glistened under the light of the moon. Now it all looked so calm and still, 
with little trace of the drama that had unfolded on the ice earlier that day. First, Stella spotted the shadowy shape of the Rolls Royce, which had sunk into the depths below. Then the girl caught a glimpse of a tiny figure far under the ice at the bottom of the lake, wrapped in frozen reeds. There, she pointed. Wagner followed her hand down and they landed on the largest piece of ice they could find. He's at the bottom, said Stella, peering over the edge of the ice into the freezing depths below. The girl wasn't sure if a ghost could die again, but as she watched him lie motionless with no expression on his face, she feared the worst. Then she heard a splash as Wagner dived in. Stella watched in amazement as the brave owl swam down to fetch the boy. Wagner bit onto Soot's shirt with his bill and powered back up to the surface. The girl knelt down and hauled the ghost onto the ice before helping the owl up too. Wagner shook himself dry as Stella bent over the poor, lifeless figure. Uncle Herbert, she whispered. Uncle Herbert! The ghost spat some water out, which hit the girl right on the nose. Who on earth is Uncle Herbert? he asked. You're alive, she exclaimed. No, I'm dead, came the reply. The ghost looked as the girl at the girl as if she was daft. Oh yes, replied Stella. And who's this Uncle Herbert? It's you. In fact, to give you your full title, Lord Herbert Saxby or Saxby Hall. Leave it out. The ghost shook his head. Have you been at the showy, my lady? Chapter 43, Promise. Once safely back inside Saxby Hall, the pair sat together in the drawing room. The girl rekindled the fire and, sit, and told Sit the whole story. How Alberta was really his sister and had put him in a box and floated him down the river when, she, when he was a baby. That's how the people at the workhouse said I'd been found, Sit exclaimed. Floated down the River Thames in a box. Stella told her uncle how his wicked sister had recognised him on his return and had deliberately lit the fire to be rid of him forever. Soot was amazed, but it was all coming together in his mind. That day I showed up at Saxby Hall. I knew I had been here before. I could feel it in my bones. The ghost's eyes widened as he took all of this in. Well, who'd have funked it? Little old me, a lord! <laughs> The chimney sweep laughed uproariously at the idea and began affecting what he thought sounded like a posh accent. Hello, I am a lord, don't you know? What, what? Now Stella was laughing too. But it's true, this whole place is rightfully yours. I feel bad now for thinking you were just some little oik. Soot chuckled. No need, my lady. I should have been such a snob. Now I know it really doesn't matter if you grow up in a workhouse or a palace. We're all the same, really. The ghost, the ghost smiled at her. We certainly are, my lady. You don't have to keep calling me that. Just Stella will be fine. Right you are, my lady Stella. The pair chuckled together. Then Soot couldn't resist, saying with a cheeky smile, But you have to call me your lordship. Just then the great grandfather clock in the hallway times midnight. Bom, bom, bom. Christmas Eve, Stella realised, her birthday. I've just turned 13, she said excitedly. The ghost looked crestfallen at the thought. What's the matter? she asked. You're growing up. Very soon, you won't be able to see me anymore. I'll always be able to see you, Stella protested. No, the ghost shook his head. Grown-ups never can. It was hard for Stella to notice at first, but the outline of the ghost was becoming fainter. You are fading, she said softly. What did I tell you, my lady? We may say goodbye now. But I don't want you to go, she pleaded. You're all the family I've got left. Oh, I'm not going anywhere, replied the ghost. But you're vanishing now, right in front of my eyes. I told you I would. You wanted nothing more than to be older, but being a child is such a special thing. When you're a child, you can see all the magic in the world. The girl's heart was breaking. 
then I don't want to ever be a grown-up. The ghost light was almost gone now. Stella didn't dare blink in case she opened her eyes. He would be gone altogether. Everyone has to grow up in the end, replied the ghost. But even though you won't be able to see me, I'll always be here, right by your side. Now promise me one thing, my lady. The ghost was becoming fainter and fainter now. Yes, yes, what? pleaded Stella. Promise me that even though you can't see the magic in the world with your eyes anymore, you'll believe it in your heart. I promise, she whispered. The last thing Stella could see was the faintest outline of the ghost's smile. And then he was gone. Epilogue. It was an unusual Christmas Day lunch that year at Saxby Hall. Just the three of them sat around the long dining table. Stella, Wagner and Gibbon. Instead of the traditional turkey with all the trimmings, the ancient butler served up a, ro a roast hedge. It was very tough and not at all tasty, but it was a thought that counted. As Boxing Day came and went, the girl realised she needed to face the truth of what was now, what was to now become of her. As much as she wanted to stay at Saxby Hall, Stella knew she couldn't look after the whole place on her own. So she reconnected the telephone and called for help. Being still legally a child, those in charge decided that Stella needed to be packed off to an orphanage. Only when she reached the age of 18 could she officially inherit Saxby Hall. The orphanage was teeming with children who had lost their parents or had never known them. It was home to the poorest of the poor. Despite the best efforts of the kindly matron who ran it, the orphanage was incredibly cramped. The hundreds of children shared one dormitory. They had to sleep four to a bed. Baths were just once a month. There was nowhere they could play outside. Of course, Stella had grown up in a life of privilege, in a vast country house. Though she did her best to hide it, living in the orphanage made her sad. Now Stella understood why poor Soot had run away from the workhouse. Some nights she would cry herself to sleep. Stella wished for life to be better, not just for her, but for all the children there. So one morning she went to the matron with an idea. Why not move the whole orphanage to Saxby Hall? If you're sure, Lady Saxby, said the matron. It's just Stella. I, yes, I am sure, replied the girl. What use is a huge house like that with nobody inside? A big smile spread across the matron's face. It's a splendid idea. The children will absolutely love it. Indeed they did. At last all the little ones had their own beds. They were piping hot baths every night. In summer there were games on the lawn and swimming in the lake. In fact, it always felt like summer at Saxby Hall now. The ancient butler Gibbon kept all the orphans entertained with his antics. Some of the braver children even went for rides on the back of a great Bavarian mountain owl called Wagner. Of course, Stella grew up, but Saxby Hall stayed a home for children. It was the happiest orphanage in the world. Today, if you visit there, you might see a very old woman out on the lawn playing games with some of the young orphans. That very old woman's name is Stella, Stella Saxby. She is over 90 years old and doesn't let anyone call her lady anymore. Just Stella is fine. If you are a child, you might just be able to make out something else. Something none of the grown-ups can see. The ghost of a little chimney sweep playing happily with all the other children on the lawn. The end.